The Current Economic Crisis, explained by Dr. Hansen's Menlo Summer Enrichment Class 2009. Our crisis starts with America's twin deficits. When an American consumer drives home from Toys R Us with Chinese toys in his trunk and using oil that was drilled in Saudi Arabia, he is contributing to America's trade deficit, in which we import a lot more than we export. This lands a lot of U.S. dollars that we use to buy goods in the hands of foreign investors. America also borrows a lot more than, uh, borrows so it can spend more than it has. This is because cons American taxpayers in general prefer to keep taxes low but conserve costly government programs that provide them benefits. As a result, the United States government is borrowing, this drives up interest rates, and we also have a trade deficit. These two phenomena combined, the budget deficit and the trade deficit, lead to what's called a hot money phenomenon, in which there is money uh, that is liquid and waiting to be invested, for example, the foreign dollars that are now in foreign governments' hands. And these, this money is going to go wherever uh, a good investment is to be had. And at the time, a couple of years back and even before, a really good place to invest your money looked like, uh, the, the U.S. real estate market looked like a really good place to invest your money. And so a lot of investment, uh, domestic and foreign, went into the real estate market in the United States. The trouble was that the market in the United States was going through a bubble in which house prices were steadily rising and were destined to, at some point, uh, radically fall. And this primed the system for a collapse because as a lot of investment was going into real estate, all it was going to take is an unexpected fall and things could go bad. If we could look at how things were allowed to go bad, we realized that there were uh, several factors, but generally a permissive environment that was conducive to the kind of investment that occurred, the kind of risky investment that occurred. There was government policy uh, led by Congress to increase the rate of home ownership in the United States. That was considered to be a good thing. And so Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, expanded mortgage lending into very risky subprime areas to get you know, every last person and his mom a mortgage so that they could own their own house. This was a problem because these loans became increasingly risky. And as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did so, other banks followed suit and, and provided risky loans to people. And the way that these loans were to make money is that if a person was not able to pay their mortgage because they were, in a, you know, they were received a subprime mortgage and perhaps weren't even expected to be able to pay their mortgage, the bank would just take the house and then sell the house. And this was okay because housing prices were rising and the U.S. real estate market was doing great. This also... Uh, this whole investment was facilitated by an anti-regulation mood that, that had recently surfaced, the idea that markets know best and were self-regulating and so things could not get too out of control because uh, eventually the market markets would auto-correct. There was also uh, financial innovations, the advent of internet, and uh, you, you could see real-time the value of your investments. There was also derivative trading um, and the packaging of mortgages into new financial uh, instruments called mortgage-backed securities, and a moral hazard, which is very important. A, what this is, is the idea that we're doing a lot of investment into the real estate market in various ways and doing a lot of risky loaning into the subprime sector, but that if things go t really, really wrong, and the off chance that they do, the government will hop in to help us. And so it created a sort of win-win situation, either invest in a really risky area and make a lot of money, and if that really, really, really risky area blows up, the government will hop in and save you. So what happens when this bubble bursts? What happens when you make a bunch of subprime loans to people who don't even expect to be able to pay back their mortgages, and then those people don't pay back their mortgages, and then you take their house, 
and you want to get your money back by selling the house, which worked for a long time because the house prices were going up, and all of a sudden, there's an unprecedented, never before seen in the history of the United States, drop in housing prices that takes you completely by surprise. That causes a lot of problems. First of all, a lot of mortgages have been repackaged and sold into what are called mortgage-backed securities. What that is, is if I own your mortgage, I own the right to receive the payments you make every month uh, on your mortgage. And so I can you know, buy a mortgage and, and get that money. But what was now being done is that a bunch of mortgages were being packaged into what's called a security, and then you could own a small fraction of a hundred mortgages. And that was a lot safer because even if you if you're, have one mortgage and that mortgage goes sour, that person can't pay you back, you lost all your money. But if you own a fraction of a hundred mortgages, then you, you're diversifying your risk. And so maybe a few of them are going to go bad, but overall you're still going to make your money. But these started to go sour as well because house prices fell and people stopped paying their mortgages at rates that were much higher than expected and none of the money could be recouped because you could not sell back the house to make the money you had lost. And mortgage-backed securities and other mortgage uh, real estate-based investments became toxic assets, which had very strong impacts on two sectors, the financial sector and the rest of the economy. Looking more closely at the financial sector, um, suddenly what was thought to be a safe investment into the real estate market became a very, very toxic one. Banks in, and people in general decided that these mortgage-backed securities and, and, and other investments were risky and tried to sell them, get rid of them. But because some of these mortgage-backed securities had gone sour in ways that were totally unexpected and, and uh, lost all their value, suddenly no one wanted to buy a mortgage-backed security. And that's what a toxic asset is. Maybe your mortgage-backed security that you own is worth something, and maybe tomorrow it's going to lose all its value like your neighbors did. And you can't know, you can't tell, you don't know. And so because you can't tell and you don't know, you really want to sell it, but no one really wants to buy it. And so these banks and quasi-banks are stuck with, on, in their balance sheets, these assets, mortgage-backed securities, which are now worth zero, because if no one wants to buy what you own, then you have to report it on your balance sheet as having little or no value. And if suddenly your big asset, your really safe investment, your mortgage-backed security, goes from having a lot of value to almost none because no one wants to buy it, then your balance sheet goes negative. And you, are, you go bankrupt. And Le that's what happened to Lehman Brothers. They, the bank collapsed. And so these institutions that were doing such investments, regulated banks and quasi-banks, which are not regulated, the likes of AIG, ran into huge trouble. And AIG even provided insurance against this happening, said, we'll insure you against the possibility that your mortgage-backed security goes sour. And it did, and so then AIG had to pay a lot of insurance money, but they couldn't even afford to pay all that out because they hadn't seen this coming either. And because there was this greater moral hazard that if this would happen and everything were to go bad, the government would help you, people took that risk. And as a result, when everything started collapsing in the financial sector, there was panic. Looking at the rest of the economic sector and, and what happened there, um, as the house, housing bubble burst, uh, home building went down, and as a result, unemployment went up. Also, because of the collapse in the financial sector and because people's investments vaporized and became worthless, um, there was a big decrease in consumer confidence. When your neighbor has lost his job and when your other neighbor lost his life savings because he was investing in Lehman Brothers and they went under, you are going to become worried as to whether you're going to lose your job next, as to whether your savings are going to be worth anything. And so you're not going to go buy stocks, you're not going to go buy a house, you're not going to go buy a car, you're not going to go buy a new HGTV, and that is what leads to a decrease in consumer confidence. You're not confident in the future. And so you're going to start saving your money, you're going to start being very careful, and you're going to start wanting to sell 
your stocks, your assets, your investments, and and put it into a very very sa much safer place. As a result, stock prices fell. The Dow went from 14,000 to now it's at 8,000, almost halved. Um, people stopped buying cars. That's how you get the whole GM and Chrysler uh, breakdown where the government has to bail them out because they aren't selling any more cars. And this sparks a vicious cycle. Financial institutions collapse. People lose confidence. They stop investing. They start saving. As they stop investing and as they stop buying, people lose their jobs because the guy who used to make cars for GM is now unemployed, so he doesn't have as much money, so he's not going to buy a new HDTV. So the guy who used to be making HDTVs lost his job, so he's not going to have as much money, so he's not going to buy uh, other goods. And as a result, there's a vicious cycle of unemployment leading to decreased confidence, leading to people selling their assets, stop not buying as much, leading to more unemployment, and this is what leads to our recession. And this is, of course, all sparked by the panic that stems from the collapse of the housing market that spread internationally because of the hot money phenomenon. The investment in the United States housing market came from all around the world, and so everyone was losing a lot of money, and there was a widespread panic, bank runs, and banks have been failing about a rate of two a month in the United States. Um, and these two... Uh, sectors combined, the financial sector specifically, and then what was going on in the rest of the economic sector, uh, economic uh, situation in the United States, led to a panic that fueled the problems which led to more panic and results in the recession that we see now. The issue, what, what happens when consumers decide that, on, on average, that they're going to start saving instead of spending as consumer confidence goes down, is that it becomes very difficult to implement successful government policy to solve the problem. If consumers get a tax cut, like they did from George Bush in 2008, they aren't going to spend that tax cut and save the economy. They're going to save it because they're worried about their future, they're worried about their job, they're worried about their investments. And so that's not going to stimulate the economy. And that's why you have wildly differing uh, views on how to solve this problem, because the economic policy that comes from the government to solve this problem, if any, has to be able to ensure that it's going to spur spending and kickstart the economy and not just help people put money in their savings accounts, which will not stimulate the economy. Saving is a good thing, as it said, it's a uh, private good but a public sin, uh, it's a virtue if you save, it's good for you, but in general it's bad for the economy if everyone stops saving and stops buying cars and HGTVs and whatnot. Um, the other issue is that the government policies are, are hurt by what's called a, a liquidity trap. As interest rates are dropped, it becomes less worth it to invest in things like government bonds, um, because you're not going to get as much return on your investment. And so people are more likely to pull their money out of government bonds and spend it elsewhere, which is supposed to stimulate the economy. But if you drop the interest rate so low on uh, that you can't drop it any further, it's very hard to stimulate the economy in that way. And so if interest rates get dropped to half a percent, then the government can corner itself and not leave itself any room to cut interest rates any further and stimulate the economy, which makes it even more difficult to find ways to solve the problem. So as a result, something that started in the United States has spread internationally. There are a lot of arguments about blame. Is it Congress's fault because they had this idea that there should be a lot of home ownership in the United States and spurred risky investments? Is it the bank's fault because they weren't correctly envisioning risk and didn't properly take into account for what would happen if house prices fell? Is it uh, you know, the Federal Reserve's fault? And there's a lot of concern about who's going to solve this problem, because if you believe that Congress created this problem, then trust in Congress's ability to solve the problem is rather limited. And other countries also have to believe that we saw this problem is being solved, and if they believe that it's all the United States' fault, then it's going to be a tough sell to convince the rest of the world that we are taking care of the problem that they believe we caused. And the hardest part is going to be not just 
figuring out what the right thing to do is, but agreeing on the right thing to do and doing it, or we're going to be stuck without implementing any policies um, because of all the arguments that, that will emerge over who's to blame.